Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our prayer meeting here at the Oakwood University Church. Now, I know that things look a little different. Um, uh, actually, truth be told, here in Huntsville, Alabama, we're actually under a tornado watch. And so we wanted to be safe. So we're, we're, we're all here, but we're in our very various homes. But because of technology and because of your faithfulness in supporting the Oakwood University Church, we're still able to bring you prayer meeting this evening, and God still has a word. So I know we have people who are watching from all over. We have people who are watching from Maryland, from St. Martin, from Ohio, from California, from New Jersey, from Canada, from St. Croix, from Antigua, from Trinidad and Tobago and all over the United States. So we want you, I know that you're in place, but we want you to text a friend, phone a friend, tweet a friend, let somebody else know that this is the place to be, that they need to come and join us on our journey of unrealistic faith. And as we gather together, we know God has a rich, rich blessing in store for us. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you have blessed us. You've given us life. You've given us health. You've given us strength. You've given us the ability to gather here from wherever we are all over the world to be able to worship you and to spend time with you and to be fed by you and to enjoy the fellowship of this unrealistic faith journey. So I pray that you would be with us, accept our worship, accept our praise, and speak to us, speak through us, speak for us, and may we uh, experience the rich blessings that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
glory. Can't stop clapping. It's it's amazing to see just how God works in mighty and marked ways. I don't know about you, but I have been full all week. Can you believe we've been going through this unrealistic experience for almost two and a half weeks and God has been good. I promise at the beginning it's going to get gooder and gooder. And it has definitely been one of those experiences where each and every time we've had an opportunity to get together, God has done great things in our lives. It's a phenomenal thing to hear the testimonies and to see how God is opening doors, to hear the different challenges from our married folks and then also for our singles, and just seeing how God is doing great things in our lives. And I firmly believe it happens because we we are relying on the power of prayer. Just before we got started, we took time to spend time together in prayer. We're just saying, God, thank you for using us to make a difference in the lives of so many. And I just want to affirm the fact that when we get together as a body of believers, As we acknowledge what God has done and is doing in our lives, God gets excited. I've said this many times. I firmly believe that when we have faith, faith is God's love language. That When we step out and do things for him and through him, God does does great things. It gets excited and blesses us in exponential exponential ways. And, And it happens because as we have faith, it happens when we stand on the word of God. The Bible says that we can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And throughout the evening and throughout the week, we've seen the different prayer requests that have been on the chat. And one of the beautiful things that we have, we have a prayer team that not only gets on while we're while we're having this particular meeting, but in the evening and in the in the morning, they get together and they replay the service just so that they can see the chat and go through and pray for each prayer request one by one. And today I want to just acknowledge some of the prayer requests that were mentioned. Some, some, one individual said praying for protection. Those of us that are in the Huntsville area, uh, we're asking God to cover us in the midst of potential storms. Others are praying and asking God for renewal and strength for the journey. Some of them deal with some very challenging roads ahead. We're asking God to do great things. Another individual said, we're praying for restoration, that God, you restore our souls, that you give us strength to continue pushing on in spite of the challenges that we're experiencing. Another individual said, Please pray for my health. I'm dealing with various health pains. Somebody mentioned sciatica, somebody other individuals dealing with some health challenges regarding their heart or um, other areas of their body. And we're asking and believing that God can do it. Also for provision and abundance for healing and grace. And someone else said for my family to return to God. As you continue adding a prayer request to um, the chat, I want to read from Psalms 15 and verse 50 and verse 15, where the word of God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and I will, and you will glorify me. Call on the Lord, he will deliver and we will glorify him. I think that's a phenomenal um, equation. We call on the Lord, God delivers and we glorify him. 
And let's do that right now as we call on the name of the Lord. If you have prayer requests, please put them in the chat, even as we pray. God, we're doing what you called us to do. We're coming because you said your house, even virtually, it can be called a house of prayer. And so we're doing that right now. And we're bringing to you heads of the families, God. We're bringing to you those individuals that are leading out and bringing their families together in a time of worship and prayer. We're bringing to you those who are praying and asking for restoration and protection and asking you to, to cover them in the midst of this potential storm. There are others that are asking for renewal and praying, God, that you will give them strength for the journey. There are other individuals that are asking for you to pray for their specific families, dealing with um, their kids coming back to you or families being restored back to right relationship with one another. There are others that are asking for healing and protection and believing, God, that you great things. There's, there's someone asking for a miracle. They, they don't know where their tuition payment is going to come from. And they're asking, God, for you to step in in a mighty and a marked way. There are so many prayer requests, and God, it would take hours, if not days, to specifically identify each and every one of them. But I'm so thankful that your answers are not based on our specific prayers, but the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf that even when we don't know what to pray, you know how to interpret even our groanings. God, I pray today that as we open up your word, that we will experience the power, truth that is found therein that you allow somebody to have a breakthrough, that God, you will allow your Holy Spirit to transform a heart and a mind. I pray that even those who watch this on replay will be touched by that same power that we're gonna get even right now as we're watching live, simply because you said your word will not return void. And so God, I pray that you will give Pastor Snell the outpouring of your spirit, that you'll give him a divine unction to speak thus saith the Lord. So the end of our time together, people will say, truly we have been with the Lord. So God, fill us up with your spirit. Allow us to leave here change, knowing that you've been with us every step of the way. Guide us, prepare our hearts and minds to receive the word, remove all distractions so that we can say yes to your will and yes to your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. search the world to find him some do their best to fight him some let him live inside them he's jesus christ the truth the life the mission exciting hi kids we're on a mission exciting and today we're searching to figure out what is faith so your job should you choose to accept it is to work with me to find out what faith is will you join me then let's pray. Our Father, help us to understand what faith is. In Jesus' name, amen. On our Wednesday night missions, we have discovered that children have something special that everyone needs to please God, and that special thing is faith. We have also learned that the just shall live by faith, and that the just are us, so we must live by faith. But what we haven't discovered yet is, what is faith? I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, there's a scripture that tells us exactly what faith is. And what scripture is that? Uh, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. And what does that mean? Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly, but, but that's the answer. Well, kids, for once, I agree with Brother IDK. The answer is here in this scripture. So let's explore what this scripture is saying. And let's explore this scripture by talking about something I really love, chocolate chip cookies. Any of you love chocolate chip cookies? Well, if you like them, or even if you don't like them, you can still try to answer this next question as we begin our mission. What is this? Is this a chocolate chip cookie? No, it's not a chocolate chip cookie. This is cookie dough. This dough is the substance or building material of the chocolate chip cookies we are hoping for. Faith is the substance or building material of the good things we're hoping for from God. Well, we know what makes up cookie dough. Flour, chocolate chips, sugar, and a few other things. But what makes up faith? 
One of the main ingredients of faith is God's word. The other main ingredient of faith is action. When you blend God's word with action, you have the substance or building material of the good things we're hoping for from God. Now, because you've been on many missions, by now you're wondering, how do we know the word of God is one of the main ingredients of faith? So to be sure, let's have a little Bible story quiz. What did Noah do that was special? That's right, Noah built an ark. And why did he build an ark? Because God told him to build it. So Noah started building because of God's word to him. Abraham moved from his homeland and went to a place he hadn't been before. And why did he go? That's right, because God told him to go. Abraham went because of God's word to him. The Bible says Sarah received strength to have a baby at an old age. And why did she receive strength to do it? Maybe you're catching on by now. Sarah received strength to have a baby because God told her she would have a baby. Sarah received strength because of God's word to her. So just like cookie dough is the building material for chocolate chip cookies, acting because God said it is the building material for the good things God has for us. So this dough is evidence that I'm going to have cookies soon. And acting on what God says is evidence that I'm going to experience the good things God has for me. So what have we discovered about faith? Faith is acting on what God says or has said to me. Kids, mission accomplished. Great job. Let's pray. Our Father, please help us to show faith. Please help us to act on what you say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, bless the Lord, everybody. <laughs> bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And all that is within me will praise and bless his holy name. I, I'm at home tonight, but I need you to know that I'm so excited about the blood that, that I'm having to hold my mule. Listen, if you're thankful for the blood, just put it in the chat right now. The blood still works. Uh, somebody can just hashtag amazing grace. Just give uh, Sister Williams and the praise team just a virtual amen. I am just overwhelmed constantly by the blood of Jesus Christ and all the liberties that it affords to me as a son of the most high God. And it's amazing. I love how the Holy Spirit orchestrates things because that message is so critical uh, to even the things that we're going to share tonight. So we thank God for our ministers in song, uh, for the other pastors who helped pull our program together tonight. Uh, again, we're just coming in the same spirit. We're just from a different location. Uh, we got some weather here in Huntsville, but God has just kind of created a venue through technology for us to bring the word of God uh, to you just from our home tonight. So listen, I need you to know the, the promise of God is true that whenever God's people gather in his name, he is there in the midst. And so I'm thankful that as we've gathered in his name, some from near, some from far away, the Holy Spirit is with us. And so I just want to encourage you tonight to go ahead and get settled as we get ready to go into the word. Now, again, I gave this exhortation just a couple of days ago. Listen, if you're at the home and, and your kids, your, your teenagers, they're in a different part of the house. They got headphones on. They're watching TV, watching the game, playing a game. Let's go ahead and get them settled so that as a family, as a unit, we can go into the study of the word of God together. And then before we get into the word, just want to share a few brief announcements. Uh, listen, this Sabbath, we're excited that we are just about toward the end of our 21 days and God is, is doing a powerful work. In fact, this is breakthrough week for a number of us. Uh, so I want to encourage you to be steadfast. I want you to know that even though the fast portion is going to end on Sabbath, one of the things the pastoral staff and I decided to do is we're going to extend our early morning prayer services an additional week. If you're excited about that, let me see you put amen there in the chat. So I want you to know that where we were supposed to finish uh, this coming Sabbath, we're going to be right back at it Sunday morning. Again, that following Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So stay with us Sabbath and Sunday at 8 a.m. Come back again Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock a.m. We're going to continue under the theme, getting unrealistic. We're going to continue building up the body of Christ through teaching on faith. And we want you to know that each Wednesday and Sabbath, we're going to continue in this teaching series uh, throughout the month of April and into the month of May. And so we're, we're going to try to continue to add feet to the tidal wave of belief that's happening for us here in Huntsville. And I'm praying that it's impacting you wherever you are as well. And now, as we get ready to go into the word, I need you to do me a favor, be an evangelist. Uh, go ahead and be an, an internet uh, evangelist, uh, be an Apple apostle. Just share this message with somebody. If you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and just send that link to somebody. Send that word to somebody that is in discouragement, that somebody needs to be who needs to be anchored in their faith, someone who needs to be convinced how much God loves them. This is the message for them tonight. This is why I know that there are storms coming through, uh, threatening technology. The enemy did not want somebody to hear this word tonight because it is a liberating message. So do me a favor, help me share this word with somebody this evening. So what we're going to do before we jump into the word tonight, we're going to go into our covenant statement. Uh, that's going to come up here on the screen here as we get ready to go into the message this evening. And I want you to just go ahead and declare it at home, just like you would if you were in the building tonight. So let's repeat that together. Tonight, I recognize that my faith is greater than my reality. I refute the ordinary because I was created for the extraordinary. I will not allow what I see to determine what I believe. What I believe will determine what I see. I will pray unrealistic prayers, embrace unrealistic vision, begin unrealistic pursuits, and maintain unrealistic expectations. I will live by faith and not feelings. I will live by faith and not facts. I will live by faith and not common sense. Faith won't allow me to be realistic, afraid, comfortable, or limited. Saints, I am proud to say that I am unapologetically unrealistic. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God tonight. We, we, we're not trying to be common sense believers. We're not trying to be rational believers. We are unrealistic because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So tonight, I want to just have us turn real quickly uh, to one scripture tonight found in Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. 
Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. I'm going to read that in your hearing, or hopefully you have a Bible nearby. The rest of our text will appear on the screen so that you can follow along and take notes from there. Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. And even as I'm reading the scripture, you can still go ahead and be hitting that share button if you're on Facebook, sending that link to somebody, uh, settling your, your home congregation. They left their nets to follow Jesus. Every meal that they ate was because of Jesus. Every night they slept indoors, it was provided by Jesus. Every time a mob came for them and they were able to elude it, it's because they were sheltered by Jesus. And it's as if Jesus is saying, what, what I have provided for you every day, I protected for you every day. I've done miracles before your sight. And essentially, you're allowing one night season to cause you to change your mind about me. In other words, one night season on the lake caused them to change everything Jesus had been and done to them. And what I'm saying to us tonight, friends, is that you've got to be so convinced in who Jesus is. You've got to be thoroughly convinced in his care. Because if you're not, you will allow one season of distress. You will allow one season of discomfort. You will allow this present suffering to cause you to change your mind or change your appraisal of who Jesus is. And see, what unrealistic faith. It is not something that causes you to be exempt from trial. But unrealistic faith shows up in this fashion that no matter what happens, no matter what your present adversity is, 
It does not cause you to question who Jesus is. It does not cause you to change your mind about everything that Christ has done for you. See, unrealistic faith sounds like what Paul shared in Romans chapter eight, where he says that I am persuaded. Are there any persuaded folk on the line? Where he says, I'm persuaded that neither life nor death nor angel nor principality nor height nor debt nor things present nor things to come that that nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of Jesus Christ and, and see this is where we got to get beloved because there may be some circumstances that can separate you from a job there I need you to know that pandemics come and go, that recessions come in and they go out, that you know, uh, sickness comes and then it departs. But I need you to know that every trouble comes to pass, but the love of God is here to stay. And I need you to understand, beloved, that this is why you don't change your appraisal of God based upon a temporary situation, because the trouble is not going to last. But guess what? When the dust settles and the smoke clears and the trouble goes back into remission, guess what? The love that was present before the trouble came is still going to be binding after the trouble goes away. And this is why you should never change your mind about Jesus because his love is going to last longer than the trouble. Can you say amen? The next big idea that I want you to be able to see is this. The next big idea, number two, is this, is that if you think his love is earned, then you will doubt based on your, your behavior. Let me say this again. If you think that God's love is earned, then you'll begin to doubt based upon your behavior. Now, the reason this is critical, friends of mine, is that we need to recognize that God's love.
I love what the word says in Psalm 56 and verse 8. Satan says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Saints of God, I need you to be convinced that Jesus cares. Because if he didn't care, he would not keep a record of how many hairs you have on your head. He would not keep a record of all of your sorrows. I need you to get beloved that Jesus cares so much about you that he has kept count and he has kept the record of every pressure and stress and grief that has caused a tear to fall from your face. And the reason that Jesus is going to keep a record of all of your tears in his book is so that when you get to glory, he's going to be able to open up the book so that you know that there was never a single moment in your life where God was not watching, where God did not care, and where God was not concerned. And I love that Revelation 21 says that God himself is going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. In other words, I need you to get saints that God is going to have a book and he's going to have a record of every tear. And then he's going to wipe that last tear from your eye. And then guess what? He's going to burn the book. Why? Because you'll never cry another tear after that one. That's going to be the last tear that shall ever fall from a tear duct. I need you to know that he is concerned about everything that concerns you. That he is keeping track of your rising up and your going to bed. He keeps track of the number of hair follicles on the top of your head. He is aware of everything that brings sorrow and, and, and disrest and, 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 and uneasiness to the soul of his children. And if he's keeping record of such small things, you know that God is aware of the big things that cause stress to his children. The second reason you should know that God cares is this. Number two, the second reason you know that God cares is you ought to look at the other things that he values. All you got to do is compare yourself with the other things that Jesus values. Luke 12, verse 6 says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them. Watch this. who is earthly may forget, but I want you to know that I will never ever forget. And since I need you to get how unforgettable you are to Jesus, watch this. So Ephesians 5, listen, this, this got good to me, even if it ain't good to nobody else. See, Jesus says, Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. So watch this. So Jesus, the Bible says, he is the head. 
Watch this. We are his body. Y'all, oh, oh, church, I, I, I wish I was live and in person tonight. I, I wish I was on the platform and y'all were with me. The Bible says he is the head. Watch this. We are his body. Now, the problem is some of us, when we see that analogy, we think that that's just dealing with the unity of the church. But when he says, I'm the head, and you all, meaning us, we are the body, what he's talking about is how inseparable the church is from Jesus Christ, because a head and a body are inextricably bound together. So watch this, because the head and the body are one, I need you to know that I can forget my phone, but I can't forget my hand because it's a part of the body. I can forget my water bottle, but guess what? I can't forget my shoulder because it's a member of the body. I can forget my iPad, but I can't forget my leg because it's a part of the body. And Christ is saying that you are so much a part of me. This is why you cannot be forgotten because the head will never go anywhere without members of the body. So wherever the head goes, guess what? The body's got to go. And when I need somebody to understand that you are so linked to Jesus as a member of his body, that it is not a matter of forgetfulness because you are one with him. Because when you hurt, he hurts. He can never, ever forget about you, his children. That he cares is because you are not an afterthought, my friends. So, so the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, I need somebody to understand, beloved, that there is nothing about you that is accidental. There, there is nothing about your life that is the result of anything that is random. It is not the result of luck. It is not the result of just biological process. I need you to know that before you were a thought in your parents' mind, that your life had already been conceived in the mind of Jesus and that you are his workmanship and that you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you to do. Watch this, saints. In other words, your works were prepared in advance for you to do. And I need you to get this. If he already planned out your work in advance, I need you to know everything you will ever need has been prepared in advance. I need you to know, beloved, it may not be revealed, but your provision was made in advance. I need you to know that your job was prepared in advance, that the spouse you shall marry is being prepared in advance. In other words, I, I need you to understand that just like a parent it is already thinking ahead about a child's tuition and they're already, already thinking ahead about school clothes and they're already thinking ahead about graduation. See, the reason the child can just live their best life now is because the parent is already thinking ahead. And what I'm saying to somebody tonight, the reason you can rest tonight on your pillow is because God has already been thinking ahead. The reason you don't need to worry about the chaos on your job is because even if you lose it, God has been thinking ahead. There's somebody that needs to stop being overwhelmed with financial sorrow. Why? Because God has been thinking ahead and he has already made provision for everything that you do need. He's already made provision for everything that you will ever need because you were created in Jesus Christ to do good works that were prepared in advance. If that makes sense to me, you say amen. So I want to shift thoughts real quickly because see, there's somebody who's going through a tough experience and going through some difficulties. And you want to know, all right, pastor, how can I know God loves me even when it's tough outside? There's some things I want you to see tonight. So I want to put this up on the screen here. All right, so how do I know that God loves me? How do I discern his love in tough times? Say this thing I need somebody to understand, friends of mine, is that even when God is giving you tough love, I need you to know that everything he does towards you is still love. 
So I need you to understand even somebody who is being chastened by God. I need you to get that even his discipline is proof of his love for you. Oh, God. If you can't say amen tonight, just say ouch. I need you to get saints that even his discipline is proof of love. So look at Hebrews 12 uh, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And he says, endure hardship as discipline. Watch this, because through discipline, God is treating you as children. In other words, friends of mine, I think all of us had earthly parents or have earthly parents. And I need us to understand that when we are children, no discipline is good. No discipline is enjoyable, but it is not until you see what discipline produces that you are able to see your parents' love, not just in what they give you in terms of gifts, but like one of the ways you know a parent loves a child is not just that they give them games or, or money or sweets, but parents that love their children give them discipline. So, 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 like I remember, maybe a few years ago, um, you know, my 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 I, one of my kids had a uh, a uh, a birthday party, and so what happens is we had a number of kids that were there for the birthday party, and, and so we were at this little outdoor venue, and, and so what happens is we're giving out treats to all these kids. Now there are a bunch of little brown kids that are around there. So what happened is one of my kids got a little too close uh, to the spirit, the merry-go-round when it was spinning too fast. And so I, I kind of pulled them back and tried to let them know, you know, that's dangerous. It can be very painful, so on and so forth. And, and so what happened was there was a lady who pulled me to the side. And she said, that's, that's your, your, that's your little one right there. I can tell. And I said, how can you tell? Do we look that much alike? And, and she says, no, I, I can tell that's yours because that's the one you were getting on. And, and see, she saw me giving out candy to everybody. She saw me giving out treats to everybody, but she knew the one who belonged to me because she saw the concern and love in that I was trying to discipline. In other words, I wasn't running around chasing all the kids, trying to keep them from getting close. I wasn't running around telling all the kids not to leave or go to the exit. Listen, there were certain ones that I applied discipline to and she could tell the ones who belonged to me because those were the ones that were receiving chastisement. And see, I need us to understand, beloved, that even when you're being chastened by God, it's love. Even if you're being buffeted by God, it is the proof that you are a son or a daughter. And see, there are times where we think God doesn't love us because we endure some chastening. But even when God is put, applying the rod of correction to our lives, that rod is the proof or the evidence that we are loved. See, see, I need you to get that if God, see, this is how you know you are worth saving. See, the reason you know worth, you're worth saving is because God hasn't given up on you. See, God has not given you over to a reprobate mind. He's not even chiding with you anymore. He's not striving with you anymore. But guess what? If he's still striving with you, if he's still chiding with his creation, Oh, uh, somebody out in the chat, I'll just say, God, I thank you that you're still striving. Lord, Lord, I thank you that you're still chiding me. Lord, I thank you that you're still buffeting me. Why? Because you constantly dealing with me is the proof and the evidence that you're still in the process of saving and sanctifying and redeeming me. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen tonight. So number one, we know we're loved because he disciplines us. But then the second way we know we are loved is because he gives us his law. In other words, I need you to get this. The Bible says, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 24, that the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees uh, and to fear the Lord our God. So watch this, so that he might always prosper us and to be kept alive as it is this day. I need y'all to shout on this tonight, saints. I need y'all to understand this about the law of God. The law of God is not for the purpose of prohibition. The purpose of the law of God is so that he might preserve us from dangers that we cannot see. In other words, I need you to get that the law is not restriction. The law of God is actually love and liberty. 
and see the immature see the law as a burden. The, the, the immature see the law as something that depresses. But when you understand what's on the other side of those restrictions, when you realize what we're up against, you realize that the law does not depress, but God's law actually delivers. In other words, it, it's just kind of like this, even though I, I like to go fast every now and then. I, I realize that the speed limit, that law, is not designed to just burden or limit my fun. I need us to understand that the speed law is literally put in place, not just to preserve my life, but to preserve the life of everyone I'll come in contact with. So even if I don't necessarily like the speed limit at a particular time, I appreciate it because I realize that it preserves life, that it preserves health, that it is put in place to preserve the well-being of society. And I need you to know that the law of the Lord is liberty, that the law of the Lord is actually deliverance. Oh, Lord, young people hear me on this tonight. The only thing God is trying to keep you from is heartache. The, the only thing God is trying to keep you from is pain. The only thing that God is trying to keep you from are the hellish bands of iniquity. And see, I need you to know that one of the enemy's greatest deceptions is to make bondage look like freedom and to make freedom look like bondage. In, in other words, I need you to know when Adam and Eve were in the garden, that, that, that one restriction, that one law that God gave, don't touch the tree. See, I need you to know that that law was designed to preserve their liberty and their freedom. And it wasn't until Adam and Eve ate the fruit and, 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 and a lamb was, was shed and, and, and death began to come upon all men that they were able to recognize that the law was not designed to bind them. But it wasn't until death became a part of their equation that they realized that the law of God was designed to preserve and keep them so that they would not be in a hostage situation held sway unto sin not just to them, but to all their descendants. So I need us to understand that even the law of God is love. Then third thing I want you to get is that even waiting, it, his delays are love. So, so, and I'm not going to stay here long because we talked about this on Sunday, but I need us to understand that God's timing is perfect. Somebody says his timing is perfect. I need you to know his timing is not good. His timing is not convenient, but his timing is even perfect. And there are some things that we wanted in one season that actually bless us more when God delays it and allows it to happen in its more appropriate season. So, so let me let me move quickly here, because what I want to do real quick before I close is I want to talk about the role of the cross in our faith, because one of the reasons we struggle with faith, saints, is because we are not using the right metrics to measure his love. Let me say this again. The reason we struggle with faith is because we're not using the right metrics to measure his love. See, again, you will never have unrealistic faith unless you are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt of God's concern or care for you. You will always live in doubt. You will always want to take one step faith for one faith step forward and three steps back until you believe not just in a theological way or in an intellectual way that 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 you are it for Jesus Christ that you are the apple of his eye and the object of his supreme affection and we will never be convinced outside of the cross so number 1 this is the first thing i need you to understand as we consider the cross tonight number 1 his sacrifice friends of mine is the ultimate show of his love I love what John 15 and verse number 13 says. It says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his love, lay down his life for one's friends. In other words, since I need somebody to get this, that faith does not begin at your bank account. It begins at the cross. Faith doesn't begin at your job site, it begins at the cross. See, see, hear me on this, saints, because the most obvious 
and demonstrable evidence of God's love for you, my friends, is actually seen in his sacrifice for you at Calvary. And see, the reason this is critical is that Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, then he would lay down his life for his friends. And see, friends of mine, I, I'm literally, I, I, this is hard for me to contain that Jesus refers to us as friends. See, see, he doesn't call us servants. He doesn't refer to us as peasants. He doesn't refer to us as understudies. He doesn't refer to us as mentees. But Jesus elevates our status and he calls us his friends. And see, the problem is we're trying to measure his love by whether or not he gives us a job. We're trying to measure his concern by whether or not he gives us a mate. We're trying to measure his love by whether or not he gives us a promotion. We're trying to measure his concern by whether or not he gives us a car. When Jesus is saying that the ultimate proof of my love is not what I give you in the earthly but it is the sacrifice that I made for you in the, in the spiritual. And see, this is why, friends of mine, we are called upon to give about 30 minutes to an hour in just meditating upon the cross. Because when I understand the cross and what it did and what it affords and what it cost Jesus Christ, I will never become unconvinced of his love for me. It will be a consistent reminder of his care. It'll be a consistent reminder of his concern. I can never be unconvinced of his love if I keep my eyes locked steadfastly upon the cross. If that makes sense, say amen in the chat today. The second thing I need you to understand, beloved, the proof of his love is that Jesus has a built-in reminder of you. So look at me with John chapter 20 and verse number 27. See, so remember when Jesus Christ had died and he had been resurrected and he appeared. And I need you to know that your boy Thomas was in such stunned disbelief that even though he is looking upon Jesus Christ, he still does not believe. So, so look at the proof Jesus gives him. He says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Oh, God. God, I can hardly contain it tonight, church. Listen, I need you to know the reason Jesus cannot forget you, friends of mine, is that in his flesh, there is a reminder of you. And in other words, he says, Peter, I, I need you to be clear that he didn't say, Peter, touch my shoulder. He didn't say, Peter, touch my leg. He says, Peter, I need you to know that to touch my hands. Why? Because there is something left in my hands. That is proof that I just went to the cross. He says, touch my side because there's still a mark in my side from where they stabbed me in my side as I was being bludgeoned in order to secure your salvation. Watch this church of the living God. I need you to get beloved. The reason that Jesus can never forget about you is that every time he looks at his hands, the nail prints, and the scars that remain in the glorified body of Jesus are an ever-present reminder of you, those that he has loved. I need you to know, friends, that God loved you so much that he has given up omnipresence permanently so that even when we stand in glass, having been stripped of our mortality, having been given away our, incor our corruption and being gifted with incorruption. I need you to know that the glories of heaven will simply be a scene of majestic perfection where there is no more mar, no blight. There is no evidence of the curse anywhere in the celestial beyond. We will have a glory body, no sign of decay, no sign of death. There is no proof that we will have gone through the things that we have gone through. But I need you to know, friends of mine, that there will be only be one evidence of the curse. There will only be one imperfection in glory. And the only imperfections in glory that are a reminder of the curse are the scars that are still 
in his hands and the nail prints that are still in his feet and the scars that will be born in his side. And I need you to get that the nail prints in his hands are an eternal reminder of the price that was paid in order to secure your salvation. And friends of mine, the reason he can never forget you, friends of mine, is that every time he looks at his hands, there is a reminder of you in his hands. Every time he looks down at those celestial, beautiful feet, there are reminders in his feet. Every time he touches himself in the side, I need you to know that your name is tattooed in the very side of Jesus Christ. And I need you to know, friends of mine, that if he cannot forget you, because your name is tattooed in his in his hands. I need you to know that if he didn't forget you at the cross, he's not going to forget to pay the bills. He's not going to forget to keep the lights on. He's not going to forget about your medical diagnosis. He is not going to forget that your children are wayward and, and are in need of his care. I need you to know that there are reminders of you, friends of mine, in the body of Jesus Christ. And I need you to know, friends of mine, that he cannot be forgotten. You cannot be forgotten. The third reason, beloved, we need to be convinced about are his love. I need you to remember, number one, that he came for you. <laughs> Watch this, saints. We love him not because we are good, not just because we just had this heart for God. We love him, friends of mine. The word of God says, because he first loved us. I don't need you to revise history. First John 4, 19. Don't revise history. Just make, don't make it seem like you just had this aptitude for God, like you just had this desire for God. Even if you've grown up in church your whole life, I need you to know that you are in this covenant because Jesus came seeking after you. Romans 3 says that there's none righteous. No, not one. There are none that seek after God. I need you to know that the only reason we are here is because the Father drew, drew us here. And I need you to know that you didn't even have an ap appetite for God, even the appetite for God and our awareness of God it is that that was him advancing toward us. The only thing that we did right somewhere in our lives is at some point we said yes. At some point we surrendered. At some point we yielded to a divine invitation. But the invitation was not from earth to glory. The invitation came from glory down to earth. And I just thank God, friends of mine, that I'm in this covenant because he made the first move. Because Jesus reached out first. And is there anybody that can just say, Lord, I thank you that you didn't wait for me. I praise you that you didn't wait for me to get right. Lord, I thank you that you didn't wait for me to make up my mind. I can admit tonight that I love you because you first loved us. Can the church say amen tonight? Fourth thing that allows us to know that he's concerned about us is you just got to look at what he already gave. Look at what he already gave. Watch this. Romans 8.32 Romans 8.32, watch this church. Look at this. This is good news. See, I'm saying this to anybody that's distressed about, man, how these bills going to get paid and, and, and you know, is God going to come through with the job and, man, is my medical situation going to ever turn around and is God going to kind of take care of my kids? Watch this. Romans 8.32, and this is why I said faith begins at the cross, not in your crisis. It begins at the cross, not at your bank account. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Watch this. How will he not also with him graciously or freely give us all things? Did y'all catch that tonight, church? In other words, G listen, listen. <laughs> okay, okay, Lord. Uh, slow it down. Watch this, church. If God was going to withhold something from us, it wouldn't be the rent money. <laughs> if he was going to withhold something from us, it wasn't going to be the money for tuition. If he was going to withhold something, it's not going to be his protection. If he was going to withhold something, it would be Jesus. Oh, God. Because, see, I need you to know everything else God provides for us. He does that with the commands of his lips. Uh, 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 make me large on here, Christian. I need y'all to see me on this. See, I need you to know everything else Jesus did in creation. When he wanted there to be light, he spoke light. When he wanted vegetation to come from dry ground, he spoke it into being. When he wanted to separate the firmaments above from the firmaments beneath, his words accomplished that. When he wanted to put fish in the sea and 
towel in the air. His mouth did that. So much so that he spoke and it was done. He commanded it and it stood past. I need you to know everything else that God, the, every miracle that he did, he had the power to just speak it into being. But see, I need you to know that when he went to the cross, there was a different currency that, that our salvation was not paid for, as Peter says, with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So watch this. If he was going to withhold something, it wasn't going to be money for the bills. If he was going to withhold, it was not going to be tuition. It was not going to be protection. It was not going to be your earthly sustenance. If he was going to withhold anything, it was going to be Jesus. But guess what? Because he gave us Jesus, Romans 8.32 says that if he gave us the son, he is the proof that with him, He's going to give us everything else we need. In other words, how is God going to give us the greatest gift and then withhold the inferior gifts? Oh, God. Why would he give us his son and refuse to give us the rent? Why would he give us his son and then refuse to give us a spouse? Why would he give us his son and then refuse to give us a job? Why would he give us his son and refuse to provide healing when we need it? In other words, if God gave us the most precious gift, why then he would we refuse the latter gifts, which he can just speak into being, that he can just issue with his tongue? If he gave us the most precious gift, if he was hung high and stretched wide and lowered his head and then he died, if he rose up on the third day to complete our justification, I need you to know that everything else that you will ever need is guaranteed these lesser gifts are guaranteed because he's already given us the superior gift in the presence of the son of god jesus the christ can the church say amen listen last thing that guarantees us that he's concerned the reason you ought not ever question his love the reason you can abide in his in 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 faith is because see your value friends of mine and I, i'm gonna say this y'all get tired of hearing me say it i need you to get beloved that your value, friends of mine, is not seen in your pay stub. Your value is seen in your price tag. Desire of Ages 668. This is how you know you got value to God tonight. Listen, I'm, 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 I'm rounding the corner. Listen, the Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. He desires his chosen heritage to value themselves. Watch this. According to the price he has placed upon them. Ooh, saints. You got to value yourself, not according to the, the, the value somebody assesses you, not to the value that your boss ap uh, applied to your position, but to the price he has placed upon you. I hope somebody is getting this thing tonight, saints. Uh, he, God says God wanted them, else he would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand to redeem them. He has use for them and he is well pleased when they make the very highest demands upon him. They may expect they, that they may glorify his name. They may expect large things if they have faith in his promises. Are y'all hearing the word tonight, saints? You see, my prayer, friends of mine, is that somebody is hearing the word tonight, that somebody is able to understand that your value, friends of mine, is seen in the price that was paid in order to secure.
deficit or lack I shall ever have, God is going to provide it because the proof of my value is not in how much I get paid. The proof of my value is seen in how much was paid in order to secure my salvation. And I understand, and even as I'm looking at this chat, that maybe we've had some challenges with our technology tonight. It's because the enemy didn't want somebody to understand this message and hear it tonight and respond to the goodness tonight. But maybe God has ordained for you to hear this word because God has wanted you to see your value in the light of the cross. And maybe tonight you need to make it up in your mind to be able to respond to the power of God and the message of salvation. And tonight you need to make it up in your mind and say, I'm going all the way with Jesus Christ. I'm going all the way in a committed relationship with him. And if you want to make it up in your mind to say, I want to enter into this covenant. I want to go all the way with him. So I'm going to go to OUCSDA.org forward slash and connect on that connect card to make that decision to say, I want to follow after Jesus Christ. I, I want to be baptized for the remission of my sins. I realize I can't save myself. I may have gotten myself into this trouble, but I trust God to get me out of it. I trust God to come to my rescue. I trust God to do it. I trust God to bring it to pass. You realize that salvation is a response to his love. He first loved us and he draws us into relationship with him. So I want to invite you tonight to just go to OUCSDA.org forward slash connect card to make that calling and election known, uh, to make that calling and election sure. So tonight, if you hear his voice, please don't harden your heart. Don't say tomorrow. Don't say wait. Don't say later. Make the decision tonight to go all the way in a fully committed relationship to him. And, and don't make the decision based out of coercion or fear of hell or, 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 or condemnation. I need this to be a love decision where you're able to see him high and lifted up. You're able to see the Savior's love in the light of the cross. And it is that love that awakens faith that causes you to be convinced of his concern to help you to know that you, he values you, values you too much for you to ever be forgotten. Father in heaven, would you bless your children tonight? I am praying that we will be so thoroughly convinced of your love. May we be so thoroughly convinced of your care and your concern that we would know that if you gave us the son, that there is no earthly deficit, no earthly lack that you will not meet that the cross is the foundation of faith, that our faith would emerge through an understanding of what you did in order to secure our salvation. So Father, I'm asking in a very special way that you would just allow somebody to have a faith that is expanding, a faith that is multiplying, because they're beginning to look at your love and your concern, not by what's in the bank, not by what their enemies say, not through the opinions of men, but they're looking at your love in the light of the glorious cross. So Lord, would you please bless us? Would you keep us? Would you seal us until the day of your glorious visitation, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, let those who believe say together, amen and amen. Friends of mine, I pray that you were able to receive this word tonight. And listen, if there was somehow some technical difficulty that got in the way of you receiving the word tonight, do me a favor. Listen, we're going to put this replay up. Listen, I, I need you to hear me, saints. You cannot afford to miss what was shared tonight. I need you to share it with somebody else. I need you to go back in, soak it in, meditate on it. Listen, this is one of those linchpin messages. This is where the whole series comes together as we look at it in the context of the cross. So do me a favor. If this message blessed you tonight, I want you to know we need you to help a breath of life. Uh, do me a favor, man. We need you, number one. We need you to pray for us. We need you to pray for us. We're up against it. Enemy is warring against us in an unusual fashion. Then number two, what I need you to do is I need you to just kind of spread the word, just like it, share it, like text the link and send it to, it, to as many people as you can. And then third thing we need you to do is help give to Breath of Life. Two nine six four six zero, 
or you can cash app at dollar sign breath of life dot breath of life tv if you were blessed tonight this was helpful for you tonight don't even wait till tomorrow don't wait to put it in the mail right now you can just get on cash app cash app a gift to breath of life or you can give it text boltv or to one eight eight three six four dot give dot give so do me a favor hang on for just a few more moments uh there's some important announcements that pastor goodridge wants to give also want to encourage you to get the book uh get unrealistic you can go now to breath of life um to our breath of life website breath of life uh dot tv forward slash store especially those of you who are leading ministry groups a lot of you reached out said listen pastor i want to get more than one i want to order some for my men's group for my women's group for my ministry group you can get them with for a little less expense at breathoflife.tv forward slash store or if you need to get a little bit more quickly you can download the ebook right away or you can go ahead and go to amazon.com and you can order your hard, hard copy there as well and i need you to know saints just want to testify to the goodness of god god is allowing this movement testify to the goodness of God. God is allowing this movement and the word of this book to get outside of the boundaries of Adventism or outside of the boundaries of our church. Got an opportunity earlier today. Uh, many of us are aware of Tavis Smiley, a uh, nationally uh, known uh, uh, syndicated uh, talk show host and, and journalist. He got word about what we're doing and the faith revival that's taking place. Had a chance to talk to him on his radio show earlier today about the book what it's doing in the body of Christ and amongst the people of God. And so what we're going to be able to do, you weren't able to catch that earlier. We're going to be able to take that and put it on our Breathe podcast in a couple of weeks. So I want you to know if you missed it earlier today, uh, my conversation with Tavis Spiley, we're going to make that available on our podcast, Breathe, in just a little while. And we'll give you some more information about that in times to come. God bless you. Stay with us. Pastor Goodrich has some information before we close. So listen, I know that we've had some challenges. I know that, you know, the storms here in Huntsville, uh, we, we've been, it's been buffeting us and, and, and intermittent on Facebook, intermittent on YouTube. So listen, we are going to, we've recorded everything and we're going to post everything on YouTube and we and it, it should be available on Facebook already. Um, and you can go back and watch it on Facebook, but we're going to post it on YouTube. But what, as Pastor Snell said, what I need you to do, I need you not only to watch it yourself, but I need you to send it to everybody in your friend circle. Everybody, share it with everybody on you, with, 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 within your, your, your group, your, your Facebook, your Twitter feed, you know, whatever it may be, share it on social media. This word was so powerful and the Lord knew that this message, this gospel must be preached. So I need you, when we are able to post it, if not tonight, tomorrow, when we post it, I need you to share it and send it to as many people as possible. This was a word tonight. God loves us. And because he loves us, we can stand on his word and we can trust him and we can have unrealistic faith because of who God is and what God has done. Have mercy. What a word. What a word. And it continues tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., we're continuing our unrealistic morning devotional series. And as Pastor Snell mentioned, we will be extending it for a week. So there's still time for you to let people know to hop on board at 6 a.m. And if they can't make it at 6 a.m., watch, uh, watch the rebroadcast later. So that's, that's then. Sabbath, we're going to continue our series on unrealistic faith. The students will be leading out in the service, but we're continuing the theme of unrealistic faith. God is doing something mighty throughout, not just the land, but throughout the world. 
those of you in, in Trinidad, those of you in St. Martin, those of you in Canada, those of you in Africa, those of you in Jamaica, those of you in England, all over the world, share this, share this. You too can get the book. Go on Amazon, go on breathoflife.tv and share this message. God has a word for us. God has a plan for our lives. And God has something special that he has called us to do. This revival is not about, is not just about, oh, so I feel good. And, and yes, it's, it's about me. No, it's about reviving us so we can turn around and share this goodness with somebody else. As we prepare to close, we want to thank God for using Pastor Snell, for choosing us. And I want to thank you for being a part of this journey, this unrealistic faith journey. And I want to encourage you to share with somebody else. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you have done, even with our faults and our flaws and our failures and our foibles. You still love us and you still invite us to accept you, to accept your word and to lean on you with unrealistic faith. Lord, help our doubt, help our disbelief and give us the assurance that we have eternal life based on your love for us. Grant us a safe night. Those of us in Huntsville, those here in the so southern United States, as the winds whip and as the uh, conditions are, 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 are whipping up in terms of possible tornado warnings, I ask that you would keep us safe, that you would keep our property safe, that you would put a hedge of protection over us so that we can have a good night's sleep tonight, resting in you to wake tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time to hear another word, to hear another nugget, another gem, to be fed on your word, on unrealistic faith. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what you have done. And thank you in advance for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time. God bless you.